Thank you for that. Uh, Claudia, thank you to the organizers of this forum. It's been very interesting hearing everyone and I hope um, this presentation will be interesting to everybody as well because I realize after hearing everybody that I'm coming more from an um, anthropological perspective rather than an art historical perspective. So that's going to shift my view a bit. Um, so I'm just hoping it'll be interesting for everyone and in, it can add um, perspectives to all of our researches. Um, so my working title for this presentation is Who Cares About the Venice Biennale? An ANT-ish Inquiry into the Global South's Participation in World Fairs Today. Um, so I thought, um, well, never mind. Can I go back? Yeah. So this paper, what I want to do is I wanted to trace out the different reasons why different countries choose to attend biennials and why. And why do these matters matter? Why is this question worth asking ourselves? Um, and I wanted to do so following Rita Felsky's invitation for mid-level analysis of the art world and how artworks are taken up, circulated, animated, and how they in turn animate, circulate, and drive. Um, so I'm gonna focus on countries from the global South, specifically Chile and specifically uh, on the Venice Biennale. Biennale attempting to flesh out a more nuanced and complete description of the participation in these events. Um, knowing as we know, right, uh, it's been mentioned a couple of times now, the power disparities that operate in the space, its colonial legacy, and the sheer cost of sending a team, shipping an artwork and paying for participation. It can seem surprising to see countries buying again and again to be seen and heard at the Biennale spaces. I will attempt to go beyond binary understandings where participation from the global South countries is often framed in black and white terms, either an act of colonial homage where these countries surrender their agency to partake in these cosmopolitan circles with the hope of someday being truly accepted or as an act of anti-colonial heroic resistance, which must be forcibly political unmasking the inner workings of such fairs. Following Nora Sternfeld's ideas of instrumentalization and power circulation, I will study the Venice Biennale not as a one-way appropriation of global artistic capital, nor a two-way relationship between an institution and a country, but a multi-layered and entangled network where actors exhibit varying levels of agency, buy for visibility, status, economic gain, symbolic capital, soft power, aesthetic pressure in the international stage. By tracing these tensions, frictions, and encounters, we can flesh out a more complete uh, account of these events and the agents that inform and affect them. So the main questions I want you guys to be thinking about are what ties are being forged, where, when, why, and to whom, and what do they tell us about the world today? Um, so really, I want to start. wanted to start out explaining briefly a and I don't know some people might be familiar with it, some people might not. It stands for Actor Network Theory. ANT is a theoretical and methodological approach to social theory that takes everything in the social and natural world to exist in constantly shifting networks of relationships. So it posits that nothing exists outside these relationships and outside of these networks. So there's no inside or outside, there's no above or below. It is horizontal. All the actors involved in a social situation are on the same level and thus there are no external forces, social forces, beyond what and how the network participants interact at present. So ANT is very critical of very abstract ideas such as society or culture um, that are sometimes taken to kind of exist outside of reality, informing um, why and how things happen so that sometimes researchers will try to shoehorn um, a situation or the research into these categories instead of just being descriptive of what is actually happening. Um, so rather what ANT is going to try to do is observe very closely what is happening on the ground, how actors are connected to each other, what they do, how and why. Um, so it's very dependent on description, on seeing what is happening and on empirical work. Um, it's gonna shy away from single, all explaining uh, meanings, um, causes, and it recognizes that we are in constant flux. Um, 
all agents are also seen to be on the same level um, and they shape, influence and transform each other. So it's additive and not subtractive. It's going to look for uh, different causes and different explanations rather than just one single one, looking to account for various factors involved. Um, although it is called a theory, ANT uh, does not seek to, seek to explain why a network's a network takes the form that it does. Rather, it looks to explore as thoroughly as possible the ties within a network. Um, and as Bruno Latour, one of the main exponents of this uh, theory, he says, explanation does not follow from description. It is description taken much further. Uh, so we can only draw conclusions from empirical detail. So it's rather a way of looking at things and a how to. To, to briefly explain, um, the A in ANT is for actor. An actor is anything that makes a difference. It could be objects, ideas, processes, architecture. It can be people, it can be human or non-human. Um, so any relevant factors that are making a difference within a network and a situation. A network are things, um, recognizes that things only exist in relations, and but these relationships can take all kinds of forms. And that each network is a group of actors working together um, where the actors can gain support, enroll allies, extend their influence. Um, so not just things that we make, but that sort of make us, we are enmeshed within this um, network. Um, and although things are treated sym symmetrically, I said it's horizontal, uh, there's recognition that some agents will be more powerful than others as they seek out alliances, um, yeah, and allies. Um, and there are connections and conflicts within networks that are the other things we're trying to trace out. And finally, theory. The theory says that we should let the actors speak for themselves. We should let them express themselves, following them as closely as we can on the ground. Um, I am specifically attracted to this method because of its nuances. It illuminates loops, nets, and meshworks that are not apparent when we simplify matters with abstract forces such as the social, the natural. Um, I'm also interested in it because it open, it illuminates the work of more agents. It opens up, up doors. So it shows how agency is distributed and how power circulates and moves. And thus, it shows how things can be changed. Um, and it looks at how a range of things comes together and thus showing more clearly and more honestly how things happen and why. Then we have ANT-ish. Um, ANT-ish refers to um, the, um, the name that Rita Felski gives to a way of situating ANT theory within the arts. Um, it looks it's a mid-level analysis so it stands between um the sovereign modern criticism that um humanities do that close reading of an artwork or, or a text and between more sociological or grand narratives that sometimes can be what black and white between um whether an artwork or a network just sustains or opposes inequalities. Um, she's gonna say that not everything is ideologically complicit or res resistant. Um, so we're just gonna be adding layers to these attachments. Um, she speaks of a work net. So she situates the artwork in the middle of these meshworks and looks to uh, balance our interest for the work and the context that surrounds them. Um, it stresses how people connect to art and how art connects to other things and how art also does things to people and to buildings and to laws, as we're going to see. Um, so it doesn't get stuck again in the very small or in the very large, but traces out the mediations in between, looking at how things are made. Um, all these ties must be traced, again, very empirical and not assumed, in order to do justice to what artworks do and what they mobilize. Why do people seek out artworks? What are the different motives, interests, and concerns? What is an encounter with an artwork like? 
How are they sustained, suppressed, or reconfigured? And what do they sustain, suppress, and reconfigure themselves? Um, so we're not going to be looking at how an artwork or a biennial is a microcosm of the world, reflecting the world, but rather what kind of worlds are being made through the biennial and through the artworks, and what kind of ties are being forged, what kind of worlds are being born out of these relationships. And by tracing out these different attachments, um, the attachments that are born of these relationships, a range of actors and agents will come into view, each with their own interests, affinities, empathies, and ties. We'll see that the mattering of the biennial can be affective, aesthetic, political, economical, ethical, intellectual, or a combination of all of these. And by doing this tracing out, we can look at how things might change looking at this again distributed agencies so i will look i will focus to keep things short i will focus mostly um this is the artwork um for the tilian pavilion in the in the biennial of 2022 so we'll focus mostly on the relationships between the institution of the biennale uh di venezia and uh, the nation state of chile and uh, through describing this relationship, we'll see what other agents um, appear, what they're doing, why are they doing, how power circulates between them, um, and how these relations, how all these networks can permit parasitic relationships that are not one-sided, um, but which are used in two or multiple ways. So we're becoming attuned to the biennial, we're paying attention to it. Um, we're moving closely and acknowledging that it can be more than just aesthetic or just political. So very briefly, um, I wanted to start talking about the Venice Biennial itself. It's an what, what does the Venice Biennial do in this network? Of course, it's an institution, but it's uh, worth remembering that the Biennial is co-constructed by the countries that participate. It is created by the artworks that are there, so that by the labor of all the artists that are showing in the Biennial, of the curators, of the assistants, of the researchers, of the directors. Um, so it's we have one of those things I, I mentioned before, there's no inside or outside that sometimes the Venice Biennial, a lot of the artworks that you can see are critical of the, of the Biennial, are critical of these colonial conditions. So again, it's not black or white. It's not, in a way, the Biennial is kind of like turning that gaze on itself um, because we are all co-constructing the meanings that appear in it. Um, of course, the, Bien the Biennale offers social capital to the people and, um, countries that participate, right? But it also gains cultural capital from having so-called third world countries or developing countries or global south countries participate. If it was just countries from the north, um, it wouldn't matter as much as it does. So the Biennale is also gaining from the participation of this country. It's, there's of course economical gain, there's of course jobs being created, there's tourism, there are links between the Biennale and the city where the Biennale happenings, right? Uh, Venezia is considered a glamorous city. We have the Biennale di Venezia di Art, the Biennale di Venezia of Architecture. So there's a whole host of other agents that once we look closely appear. Um, the Italian government is another agent worth looking at, right? Um, they, it is seen to be, it continues uh, to create this notion of Italy as this grand cultural country where they're inheriting this Greek, Greco-Roman um, passion for the arts. The Viennale, what also does it do when we look at it in um, terms of time? It gives cyclicality to the art world. We know the Viennale is coming. Uh, artists know they have to prepare. Different countries have different systems for choosing who's going to go and um, represent the country. But we all know it's coming. So it's giving that uh, cyclical time. The Viennale also validates um, and uh, repudiates uh, because there will be rankings of which are the best artworks, right? But even if you're if your artwork is criticized at the Biennale, you will st still have been validated because you were chosen to be there. Um, and also, um, as I said, the Biennale is sustained by the artworks, is sustained by the countries that participate in it. Um, and it is adding to uh, art history, right? But we've been talking about this whole time. So every time an artwork is shown within the uh, Venice Biennale, we are uh, switching the canon, right? We're creating change within it. Oh, never mind. So Chile, 
right? There's so much tension today um, when we talk about national identities. It's almost kind of ridiculous today to hold that there's a pavilion that's going to rec like represent what a country stands for, right? So it's there's countless examples of how different countries have chosen to question the very idea of a national pavilion. How, why do we still do it, right? Again, there's a recognition. There's this effective recognition of Chile thinking, we want to be part of this. We, wa we want a seat at the table, right? It says something about us that we have a pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Um, there's an idea that it pays to be in the Biennale, right? That it's a trade-off, that it's worth going, uh, being seen as a cultural country, as a best off. Um, in the case of Chile, there's also this idea of being a transparent country because the artworks that are uh, sent to the Biennale every two years are chosen by a panel of experts. So this idea that our country is very transparent, right? And it's also going to, within our nation, it's going to mobilize, again, the cyclicality. It's going to mobilize agents who know the Biennale is coming, who know this contest is coming. Um, so it's going to mobilize a whole host of agents who are going to vie to participate. Um, and it's a gamble, right? If the pavilion gets chosen, it's highlighted in one of the most important magazines. Um, it's just more glory to the country of Chile, right? So we're attuned to it. We're attuned to this idea, even as we criticize it, we're attuned to this idea of being the civilized country, right? That still participates, we're there. Um, even, even if this identification can change in time and be questioned. Then the, we have the artwork itself. Um, you can see it, it's there in the middle, it's a video. Um, artworks, as I said, from an anti-ish perspective, they can hook us, they can seduce us, they can cause anger, they can unhook us from ideas. They show political and ethical commitment. They might be uh, built just for aesthetic pleasure. Um, and this artwork in particular does a lot because it is an artwork created, um, it's a collaborative artwork where not many visual artists were involved. Um, so it has no authorship. It's also meant to represent the importance of peatlands and bogs in the southernmost part of Chile and their relevance not only to store carbon in times of climate change, but also um, they create a link between the Selknam indigenous people of the south of Chile and the peatlands and the need to um, create environments that sustain them both. What is very interesting about this artwork, uh, it'll come up later, but I'll just say it now, is that it's even spawned um, an, uh, the Venice Accords between several countries like the United States, Argentina, um, Iran, Indonesia, um, to take care, these countries are promising to take care of peatlands and bogs, but also back in Chile, the presentation of this artwork has impacted and then now there are laws looking to uh, more thoroughly protect these lands. Um, what else? Again, uh, why would someone from the Selknam people back in Chile would want to participate in this super colonial event. Well, it is a space to be occupied, right? It is a space to say something. It is not one way. So as Nora Stenrefell says, um, it is parasitic, right? It's parasitic, uh, power circulates, it is not one way. So it, it is up to each group, to each organization to decide how much you're gaining from this entanglement with this organization and how much is being lost and whether it is worth it. So of course, the, the artist collective decided that it is worth going to this colonial event, participating, traveling with the peatlands, with the Selknam knowledge all the way to Venice um, because they think we can occupy the space for the better it gets to be seen, right? Um, it gets to bring aesthetic pleasure. Um, it gets to, um, it helps people think about all these problems. So it, it artworks have these resonances, right? That they're very, very hard to describe, very, very hard to um, follow in that an artwork that we saw a year ago might make us think of something later or change certain commitments or the way we act. Again, it is co-constructing a narrative Right now, it's part of the voices that are being expressed in the Biennale today, even if it's not not in the main spaces. Um, artworks always have this factor of surprise, of unexpectedness. What will they do? We never know what an artwork is going to do to us. We think we might think we might like it, and then we might not, or the other way around. Um, so there's a whole range of um, connections that are really really hard to trace, as I said, but we can think that they spark knowledges, right? They might spark, spark solidarity. They might, might spark outrage. 
they might spark or stir ethical and political commitments. The artwork itself, it might be bought or sold. It might suffer physically, right, from the trip. It might be criticized. It is being in a position of vulnerability, being open to criticism, which it was criticized, as I will explain shortly. Um, it is this artwork in particular is defying expectations of authorship because it's a collaborative work, right? There's no curator. Um, and yeah, sorry, I, I I think I'm running. I don't know how I'm with the time, Claudia. You, you are exactly 20 minutes now, actually. Absolutely. Okay, so I'll just go through a couple of times very quickly, um, just to show all the other agents that one may see. Uh, the Yardini and the spaces, the Yardini can be an agent, right? It's inviting, it's inviting you to walk through. It's much nicer than the Arsenale, where so-called, again, countries from the Global South, developing countries are, where to arrive to these pavilions, you have to cross this whole other section full of artworks that you arrive exhausted and overwhelmed. Whereas in the Giardini, there are coffee shops, there is a shop, there is food, there's places to sit. So how does that also change, shift and affect our relationships with the artworks, between the artworks and the other agents? Um, in Venice, we have people such as important curators and tastemakers, such as here, I put the example of Caterina Wood, the new Tate director, um, we have collectors coming. Um, now this is the example of I said when the Venice Accords were signed for, for the protection of the peatlands. Uh, this is Helena Monani, which is the um, Serknam woman who is participating with this artwork and um, taking advantage of the space that the Venice affords. Artichok, so magazines, um, are also part of this network of agents. Um, adding their voices to all these discourse, discourses, analyzing what is happening and why. The Chilean government, I already mentioned it, and I put the example of Diego Parra, who is a Chilean critic, who criticized very harshly this work, um, saying it was um, politically correct and that it wasn't really an artwork because um, there are no artists. And so there's this whole other um, door opening about what is an artwork, um, what is not, uh, what is politically correct, and what does that mean in Chile, right? What does that mean in our local context? So just to uh, close, um, we're always oriented in some way, right, towards or against something, but art is not just a personal affair uh, or only a large force in society, but a medium through which we forge our small face-to-face -face encounters. Um, it is important that we look at the distributed agency because it helps us think more completely about the Biennale, to see it as co-composed, to realize how we all have skin in the game. Um, it also needs to uh, helps us add the layer of the aesthetic and the affective responses that we do have to the Biennial. Even I could add the picture of us having this discussion to this mix because we are all affectively entangled in this network as well. Um, it is also looking at how things have their own lives and they change. Even with the smallest, just looking at architecture, looking at the small Chilean magazine, at the small Chilean critic, um, this is all gonna shift relationships and it's gonna add or subtract. Um, and it also, um, what I find very useful for this method is that to realize that ties can be made and unmade, right? So how even ourselves today, we're unmaking ties, we're questioning them, we're striving to put things into another perspective and to shift. Um, and it's less of a heroic masculine message and more of a feminist kind of looking at situated knowledges and not this one artwork that does it all, but how different voices can create change. Thank you. Sorry for going over the time, Claudia. No, no, no worries.